Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the JLX Friends of Benefits podcast. It's Xander, your host, as always. And today I'm joined by the lovely Millie. I'm really, really excited for this one because Millie and I have worked together in the past and Millie has come on absolutely leaps and bounds since, I mean, since I've ever known you, really. Um, and it's been really exciting to watch you grow, watch you start coaching. Um, and it's just one of those things, I think, where when you see this happen in someone you know and someone you like, it's just very nice uh, to see someone be successful and, and work hard as well. So I was super excited when you said, yes, you would be happy to come on and have a chat with me. Um, and we can give these people some classic and some great info, I'm sure. So without further ado, Millie, welcome. Um, I'm going to give you a slight introduction, but as I said, I'm probably not going to do it justice, so I will hand over to you. But Millie has a degree in chemistry. Millie works in a very, very, uh, <laughs> how do we say, I was going to say explosive, but hopefully it's not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> in the, shouldn't be explosive shouldn't be yeah uh <laughs> industry and also is now coaching very 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 well so Millie tell the people a bit about yourselves for those of people who maybe haven't come across you before or maybe don't know but would like to know what what can you tell them what would they like to know and we'll take it from there awesome thank you so much for having me on this is super exciting um so in terms of my day job, um, I do have a master's degree in chemistry, which I studied for, studied hard for, for a long time. Um, and then I got a job in the nuclear industry. I'm on a graduate scheme where my job entails loads of different things because I do different rotations every kind of six to eight months. So far, I've worked on cleaning up nuclear waste. Um, I have also worked for the non-proliferation team in government, which basically means stopping countries um, producing nuclear weapons. And now I am currently working with the um, national nuclear regulator. So inspecting nuclear sites, making sure that they are, you know, not doing anything that they shouldn't be, like the nuclear police. Um, nice, so nice. some really interesting projects that I never ever would have imagined that I worked on. So that's my day job. But on the side of that, I also, within the last year, have started my online coaching business, um, which has grown so quickly, and I definitely didn't expect it to, um, but I've loved it so much. My kind of Instagram and YouTube has also grown from that, but none of that would have ever happened if I hadn't probably, you know, started with my first physique coach, who was you. So I suppose you could take a little bit of credit for, for oh. where I've got up to in life. Oh, bless you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take I'll, t I'll take credit for uh, I'll take credit for uh, maybe a one percent if that. But that's all. <laughs> no, it was the, it was fantastic in terms of um, for me to kind of understand coaching a little bit more. I have had quite a few coaches, um, and prior to us working together, I did have a powerlifting coach for a little while because that's how I kind of got into lifting at uni. Um, but in terms of physique coaching, that was something which was new to me. So um, I definitely learned how online coaching is so much different to PT and the traditional mm. kind of, you know, someone just that standing there counting your reps is very, very different. And I fell in love with it whilst I was having my own coach and had fallen into then deciding, do you know what? I really think I can help others. And um, yeah, it's been an awesome journey since. That's really nice. I think that's, I think that's what gets a lot of people into it. I think it's like, you have, I know that this is a, a kind of a podcast, maybe we could host by itself, but I know you have a background with overcoming um, illness and, and a lot of things, actually, not, not just that. And I think that when you've been through a situation like that, it gives you a certain, it gives you a certain feel for maybe not wanting other people to, to struggle like that by themselves, or maybe understanding that you have something to offer them that perhaps other coaches don't and it's nothing against coaches who've never had a bad moment or an illness or anything like that um but I think that when you've been through a lot of shit uh whether that's illness in life or or, or anything really then it gives you a bit of experience but it also gives you that kind of what it gives some people it certainly did with me that kind of drive to be like I can I can do some good with this I'm sure I can help someone um, and I'm sure you have 100%, you know, because I think one thing is being able to coach in terms of understanding the science. It's a whole new kettle of fish when it comes to dealing with a person, not a robot or a textbook, right? Um, so that that's obviously a huge part of it as well. And 
one of the things I wanted to ask you actually in regards to kind of starting your coaching journey and, and all of that. You mentioned off air, which is not something I actually thought to ask, but actually you, you mentioned it about actually having COVID, not having COVID, but with COVID in the picture. Um, that maybe pushed you a bit further in the direction of doing this, where maybe it may not have done before. Yeah, yeah. So with having the free time due to COVID, not actually having COVID and been fortunate enough not to catch it, at least I think so anyway. Um, but in terms of all of that kind of time working from home had really changed my day to day. Within my actual kind of job, my nine to five, usually in an office or going onto nuclear sites and doing different kind of inspections, assessments, etc that has stopped since that March of 2020, where we started working from home, I have not been back into an office. So I've had a lot more free time um, in terms of not commuting an hour each way. Um, and all of a sudden I was very much so stuck to think, what am I going to do with all of this free time? Because training hard um, was naturally just something which I did alongside work. But then I kind of just started researching more and learning more because naturally I, I, I'm drawn to the fitness industry. I'm drawn to understanding more about it. I do have my scientific background. So I invested a huge amount of time into that. And then as you described, I've been through certain things in my life, such as illness and trauma and different situations. You know, I've, I've overcome my kind of fairly kind of big physique transformation myself. Yeah. A lot of people have come to me for advice and that's kind of what triggered it. Not to mention that all of the roles which I've always favoured in life in terms of whether that's at university or within my career, it's almost always been like a leadership role or being the team leader, helping others. And all of a sudden, those kind of like qualities which I had and people asking me for help, I was just like, OK, let me do something here and let me see if I like it. And uh, safe to say it snowballed. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't just snowball like a snowball, though, does it? I think you're being very modest there in, in a way of like, it doesn't just kind of happen. I think a lot of hard work went into that, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, safe to say that um, social media in terms of putting out informative content and whether that's via, you know, Instagram, YouTube, all of that good stuff it does not um, just happen, you know, off the cuff, you have to make sure that the information that you're putting out is correct, is informative to the best of your knowledge, you have to do it in a way that you are translating, this is what my job has taught me to translate technical information into layman's terms, into, yeah. into a way that people can understand that and to apply it to, to their, their cells and their lives to target that at a particular niche um so there are so many different elements to consider and I found again in in lockdown I was living by myself for a, for a good while at the first lockdown just for me as a very extroverted person it was constantly like listening to podcasts head in a book so I didn't feel so kind of like lonely and alongside all of that a lot of it was educational and very quickly I kind of started to pick these things up and apply them and as I did I saw the results but there is always that element of consistency you can't just show up you know half the week and then not do it anymore because that's not you, you know that's not how you're going to get anywhere if you're only half asking it because you'll just yep. get you know half the progress yeah that's absolutely true absolutely true in terms of that you know um and actually this takes us lovely into the next question i had for you which was the biggest lessons right you know lots of people who listen to this podcast are you know coaches themselves are maybe like on the verge like mm, should i do it should i not maybe if you could just share like what pushed you just that last bit what made you just go screw it i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna give it a crack and then after that you know have, are there any things you've really learned that maybe looking back you'd wish you'd done differently or even what you could advise other people maybe to pay more attention to uh, that maybe you weren't sure you had to, um, for example? Yeah, absolutely. So one thing which I've really discovered in the last year um, and also since starting my kind of professional career outside of university is that there is never going to be a perfect time and you're never going to know mm -hmm. everything. Don't ever think that you're going to get to a stage where you're going to have everything in order and have the best client plans and have the best system that's going to work the best way, because it's not. And you're always going to have to adapt. 
So I wanted to make sure that everything that I was doing at first was perfect and I was very slow to take on clients. Um, and actually, in hindsight, the way that I learned the most was from working with more people. Not to mention, as you start to work with more people, your systems are going to have to change. You're going to have to manage your time better. You'll have to run more efficiently. The most important thing for coaching, it's not just a training and a diet plan. It's working with different personalities. It's working with different people. Each of those individuals will all have different backgrounds, different problems, different issues, different ways that they perceive information. Some people are more than happy to be told, you know, go crack on, this is what you need to do. Other people might need you there every single day to just confirm certain things. And you will never learn that if you're just um and ah in about, should I take the plunge and do coaching? If you want to help people, start helping people and you will learn along the way. It's not easy at first because, of course, we all start somewhere. You know, I, I started with not a single transformation to show off, not a single client testimonial, but you just have to embrace the suck for a little while, you know, ask friends and family to work with you. A lot of the time it's, you know, you'll be getting paid peanuts, if not nothing at all, which unfortunately sometimes means on the other side, they're not that invested into the process, but it is a journey. That is yeah. the journey that everyone has to, you, you have to earn your stripes, if you know what I mean. And that's what I've spent the last year doing. I started off with just a handful of clients who probably, you know, were more than happy to receive free information, but whether they cared about, you know, really putting in the effort is a different story. But as you deliver those results over time, you'll find it easier to work with more people and you'll find the people that you like to work with the most. Everyone has a kind of niche. You can't work with, anyone and everyone at least most people can't everyone t tends to have things that they're better at or or a certain personality type that they might work better with which is why I always you know interview not interview but have a consultation call with all of my clients to see if we'd be a good fit if they would be a good fit for me and if I would be a good fit for them it's really important I think um so there's a whole lot that goes into it and I suppose if you are asking me what you know, what do I regret or what do I think I would have changed along the way? I just think I wouldn't have held back as much as I did for as long as I did. I did because mistakes are the way that you learn. Mistakes yeah. are the best thing to learn from. So that's what that's that's what I would say in terms of that. I think that's a huge thing. And, I, and I, actually, I, I, I swear to you, that's what I thought you were going to say. When I asked that question, I thought, I bet it's going to be to do with time and and just diving in anyway, because, you know, I agree with all of those points. And Jack and I actually spoke about this a long time ago on the podcast. And and that was, I think, in a and a maybe like last July, where people were like, how do you get into coaching? Coach, <laughs> you know, pick someone, um, ask them, can I help you? You know, um, I, I think it's really, really interesting is too many people ask, you know, um, you know, can I do this kind of tell them what you've got to offer? You know, you know, I have time, I have effort, I have this, can I do something, you know, too many people are like, hey, do you have a space or like, do you have a way that I can learn off you? And it's like, you know, you're asking me to produce a problem that you can solve. Tell me you have the things that you can solve a problem that I have. That makes it so much easier for me. Um, and like, if you're going to be asking things like family members and so on, it's, it's, I think they're probably the worst for like actually adhering to a plan. Um, Absolutely. But it will challenge you. It will challenge your ability to be patient. It will challenge your ability to be more empathetic, listen and channel that in a way of trying to help these people. Because if you can't help the people who typically you love the most, how the hell are you going to help somebody else? Um, and I think that's a really important lesson for a lot of people when they go through this. It's like, ah, oh, oh, I couldn't help them because of this, or I couldn't help them because of that, or, you know, there's always a reason why. And yeah, sure, we've all had a client or two who we don't get along with. And actually, in the end, you realize you probably weren't a great fit. But mostly, it comes down to how you decide to work around that, doesn't it? It's like, the more clients you've had, the more experiences you've got, the more tools you have in your arsenal to be able to handle the situations that come your way. And, you know, I've been coaching now for six years and I still get clients who come to me with something I've not experienced before. And like, that's a wonderful thing. You know, that's a really nice thing about our work because that means to me, cool, time to open up a book. Let's get, let's get learning, you know? And I think if you're not willing to do that, 
this just is never going to be the job for you because you're only going to be able to work with three people. And they're the three people who are the easiest clients in the world who, when you ask them to do something, they do something. They're hyper responders. So even if you give them a terrible plan, they still get jacked, um, <laughs> you know. So, um, yeah, I think that's a really, really valuable point. And on diving in early, I think what have you got to lose? For most people, that's not a lot. You know, you've got no investment. You know, for you, you still had a full-time job, still have a full-time job. So if it was an extra thing that you thought, actually, this sucks a bit, it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. Maybe I could help someone or, or people in a different way. It wouldn't have been the end of the world, I don't think, for you. But, like, for, for some people, they think, if I try this and it fails, that's it. I suck. But actually, they've got a full-time job. It's like, try something else. Um, you don't need to, to worry about that. So in terms then moving forward, so business is growing really nicely. Got a lovely client base. Um, very happy coaching, I assume. Uh, really enjoying it. Any, any, t- any tea to spill? Or are we just kind of plodding along nicely still? Yeah, no, absolutely. I have recently um, just spent a lot more time developing in my own knowledge I want to touch on what you said there is in like you know you get a client with a problem you're like oh I've never seen this before time to open a book I think that is you have to have that attitude you always need to be improving your knowledge you always yeah. need to be expanding your kind of um expertise and well to be honest for, for me that's really easy my background scientist you know inquisitive yeah. nature I always want to know more so for me it's It's learning more, learning how I can help different types of people. Um, What is excellent is just that I'm so grateful for the team that I have because what this has allowed me to do is allow me to work with people who I really want to work with. It's not like, you know, you go to work and you're told you have to work with whoever sits next (laughs) to you in the office. It's my clients will stick with me if we're a great fit. So, you know, there's building that rapport, it's watching their journey over months. You know, I've, I've, I'm now getting to the stage where I've had clients who have been with me for, you know, seven, eight months. And just to know and see them progress in life and in, in fitness and health and everything, it's just freaking awesome. So um, I'm studying more. I'm still growing the business, still working with more people. Um, and yeah, just absolutely loving it. So it's it's going fantastically. And I just can't wait to help as many people as I possibly can. It's definitely infectious. I can see how passionate you are. It's it's like it's 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 so nice to to sit here and talk to someone else because I, I, you know, I remember when I first started PTing, I started online coaching. Um, I remember having the same feelings I have about coaching people now that I did like five or six years ago. And I think it's it's because of the the learning aspect. And like like you, you know, um, very science based background in science. And like to me, when I don't know, this probably resonates with you quite well. But like when somebody comes like through our initial form and, and says something, and I think. I don't know what that prescription drug is, or I don't know what that abbreviation for something is. And I'm like, my brain is like, why don't you know, go and find out. So I like spend 10 minutes or like whatever, Googling it. And then I'll get lost in Wikipedia, just pressing buttons, (laughs) finding out what other stuff is. And I just think like, that's what keeps the excitement going. Because if this journey was easy for everyone, yes, everyone would be a PT maybe, but also it wouldn't be as fun for us, right? It's the challenge in the individual that I think is fun. And you touched on something which means a lot to me personally, and that is the journey of life for people. You know, I've coached people who have maybe struggled to conceive and have managed to do that. I'm not saying that's my coaching. I'm saying like that journey of life, you know, they come to you and say, oh, look, I, you know, I'm really trying for a baby. I want to be a bit healthier, I want to be a bit fitter. And like a year's gone by and they're like still trying. And then eventually you get this email like, oh, my God. And like they're just really emotional times because it's in those moments where I couldn't care if they'd hit their fat loss goal or their recomposition goal. It's just that's just a wonderful thing to be able to be a part of someone's life and doing. And I don't know that there's many other careers where you're going to be a part of someone's life in that way for that length of time in order to see those things um so it's just such a wonderful wonderful thing I to mention that because I also had something very similar and I was just like right I've, I've got to get this woman in the best health ever like I've got to and it's so so exciting when you have something like that come along and um you know just having people say to you like I haven't actually been this healthy in years I've just ran the fastest 5k I've ever done 
oh, I accidentally just ran a half marathon today. Like I actually had that from one of my clients. <laughs> out for a run, ran a half marathon. Like, oh, okay. I didn't ask you to do that, but yeah. well done. <laughs> like, here's your gold star. <laughs> and, and then they say, oh, I couldn't have done it without you. And I'm just like, wow. Like the fact that I'm like, Helping people to believe in themselves is probably one of the most exciting things. Really, really helping people to believe in themselves. And also, as you said, you know, it's so unique in terms of I'm a very busy person. I have my nine to five. Then when I have nurses and shift workers who come to me and they're really trying their best to improve their health, but, you know, they're barely sleeping and they're on night shifts immediately I'm like right let me go read about night shifts let me go read about the sleep cycle and see what I can do so absolutely like it is you 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 have an intrinsic like desire to go and help these people and I think it, it really does have to come naturally because it's not you know if you're just in coaching to try and you know make money from it or to get somewhere like in social media or whatever good luck to you because it's a hard job and also you almost get compassion fatigue a lot of the time because you worry a lot about your clients you think about them a lot you're very caring and that can be almost a little bit more draining on yourself um so a lot of people probably don't realize that um unless they do come from that kind of coaching background it's really important to consider I it's funny you say that I think um, because when I used to PT I worked at university gym so like the year was quite cyclic in like the way it went in terms of like full-on break full-on break and I would be ill without fail every time I took a break even now like I've started making like a promise to myself that I would try and take some bank holidays off or I would try and have a day off here and there because it's something which I feel so loyal to these people to help them that actually I was so disloyal to myself you know, like I'd have, you know, a day off a week and the the, the the one week end in a month, maybe I had two days off, I'd be ill because it's like my body was like, rest. <laughs> um, and, and you know, I, I it, it, it's amazing to do a job you love what you do, right? I think it's just sometimes difficult when the decision is put into your hands to put the brakes on a little bit and be like, we need to be able to look after ourselves here because else we just cannot look after these people so well. Um, but I mean, being in a job like that is, is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And, and I feel so lucky um, to be able to do that. And like you say, incredibly grateful as well. One of the things you mentioned, which takes us on perfectly to what I wanted to talk to you about in some detail, you said about intrinsic. And it takes someone with a fair bit of intrinsic whack to want to step on a stage, doesn't it, Millie? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why would you want to get on a stage in tiny <laughs> underwear? like encrusted in crystals and show off your glutes to people who have no idea who you are for them to you know just judge your physique when you put it like that i think i want to do it (laughs) i'd pay to see it that'd be fantastic (laughs) let's get you on stage do it for charity (laughs) yeah bodybuilding i kind of fell into it it's um it's a crazy sport well do you know what it's not even class sorry sorry can you just rewind a second bodybuilding i kind of fell into it <laughs> i mean i, I did fall into drinking an extra can of monster sometimes <laughs> and i'm like mm, that probably wasn't a good idea bodybuilding i never expected to find <laughs> myself here i can tell you that for a fact i absolutely <laughs> never expected to find myself here because it was less than a year ago that i even really knew about the industry um but it was again you know kind of that first lockdown starting to get more into my kind of fitness really really enjoying resistance training that in that time where I said I started to read more and learn more and listen to podcasts and consume more content um I came across a lot of bodybuilders and for me what was particularly interesting was the um you know, finding out a bit more about nutrition and then biomechanics and how to optimize muscle hypertrophy and all of this kind of stuff. And then I realized it's a very, very disciplined lifestyle with a lot of method behind the madness and sparkly bikinis. (laughs) Um, And so again, that really resonated with me because I am someone who is... (laughs) I am very disciplined. I'm very regimented. I'm very kind of, you know, organized, logistical. I have to have everything planned out in my life, um, which, you know, COVID has then kind of taught me not to plan so far in advance. (laughs) So so I think this sport almost kind of, all of my qualities that I had 
kind of merged them and my interest in science all together. Um, but what I didn't ever think I would be doing is learning how to pose and wear a pair of heels and have to present myself in a certain way because that's totally different as well. But the reason why that is something which I was just like, right, I have to do it is because it terrified me and yeah. I thought it would be really, really uncomfortable. And it has been a super uncomfortable process, but I like to challenge myself and feel uncomfortable. Yeah. And, um, and the comfort zone only expands. So, so that's how I fell into, into bodybuilding. <laughs> I have to say like genuinely you look so confident when you do your posing practices and I guess that's part of doing it isn't it it's part of posting it on Instagram I mean I remember listening to a podcast and I cannot remember how many years ago this was um and I can't even remember who it was who was on it but the guy was saying if you can't take your shirt off in a gym good luck stepping on stage because it's never going to happen you know if you can't do the things that you're scared of now how the hell are you going to step on a stage in front of people who like you said earlier are there to judge you that's literally their job you are there to be judged based on the work that you have done um so yeah that, that that's absolutely like something i've seen from your instagram and and you know you absolutely shine through that there's no doubt about it like your confidence is is unbelievable so you wouldn't have thought that um there was a lack of confidence there but i assume that was all part of the process right just going fuck it i need to put it up and i need to, to get this going one of one of my favorite sayings which applies to every aspect of my life is literally fake it until you make it. Um, Love and it. You have to, you have to command almost authority as a coach, even if you're not super confident sometimes um, to get people to, to listen to you and to kind of understand that you are there to deliver information. Um, you have to pretend to be confident whether you're shitting it or not when you're, <laughs> you know, am I, posing in the right way am I doing the right thing it is really important to it's kind of like manifesting stuff until you throw yourself out into that uncomfortable situation and as with the coaching you know just diving in you're never going to find out whether you sink or swim That's but 99% of the time you'll find a way to swim like you really will um so it's almost like exposure therapy is what I think it is. Like the more you expose yourself to stuff, the more you are going to feel confident in it. But it's so true in terms of just the gyms reopening recently after this third lockdown, the amount of clients I've had who are not super familiar with the gym and from them just spending time there in a corner, kind of doing some dumbbell floor work and like observing, a couple of weeks into it, they're already saying to me like, oh, I went to the gym today, I absolutely loved it. Because it's just, you know, you're not familiar yeah. with the environment. You're not familiar with doing something. And the same with bodybuilding, you know, I had no freaking idea what I was doing when I first put on a pair of heels. It's mortifying when I look back now. But that's like why I've documented the whole process is because we all start somewhere and it's nothing to be ashamed of. You should never be ashamed of not knowing. You should only be ashamed of thinking that you're like the smartest person in the room because then yeah. we're just from there absolutely absolutely it's like james i think it's james clear who says you know master the art of showing up right if you can do that then you can do anything because once you've shown up enough times the 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 beginner becomes the intermediate the intermediate becomes the advanced right but you can only do that after showing up so many times and just doing a bad job you know if you do a bad job enough and you're open-minded to learning and able to take on board criticism in a way of facilitating further learning and and so on then you can very easily become very good at something i think for a lot of people and you know one of the things i used to like doing the most when i was in person PTing was taking people on who were scared of the gym because there's really nothing to be scared of but obviously that's so easy for me to say like firstly i'm a white male you know I don't have any people prejudice me for things in, in general, you know, versus a lot of other people, you know, females and so on. And I had a, I had a client once and I've said this before. So any of the OG podcast listeners might remember this, but it was the best thing I've ever heard. Um, so if anyone's worried about the gym, listen to this. So it was like her second session. And in the gym, I used to work in huge gym, massive weights room downstairs, mostly cardio, but weights upstairs, um, huge, huge place. And I was like, right, I'm going to knock this uh, stereotype on the head straight away. Second session, we're going to head downstairs. We're going to get a barbell and we're going to do some work. Her goals at the time were like glute based as well. So it wasn't just like I was going to do some bench press or whatever. It was 
targeted. And um, I got her down there and we, we started moving like a till, like looking around. And I kind of thought, I'll ask, see how she's feeling. She's, I said, you know, how, how are you doing? She was like, oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. And I was like, that's like really confident. Cool. And she was like, the truth is, I understand why you were concerned about why you brought me down here. And you're, you're like worried that I might feel intimidated. But she looked at this bloke <laughs> who was just to the left of us. And she, she kind of went to me. The truth is, I'd be intimidated, though, if I was him, because look at the size of him and look at those small weights. She said, no one's going to expect me to lift big weights. So if I do that, that's great. You know, but I'm looking at him thinking, surely you can lift more than that. That just actually broke me. I just thought this is the best thing ever. Like what an amazing turn of events, like what an amazing attitude to have. And I think like so many people get caught up in what we should or what we expect from ourselves or like what social media has and you know they see people doing huge lifts or looking great but people only got there because they did all the shit to start with right they did all the nitty gritty and I guess that's kind of our job now to be like come on the quicker you start this journey the quicker you'll be where you want to be um, and that's why like I'm not always a complete like opposition to comparison I think sometimes in the right hands comparison can be a good uh, good level of inspiration because you know saying to people well if you want to look like that fine you probably can but you're not going to do that sitting at home and you're not going to do that with the current routine you have so change these two things and maybe people will start comparing themselves more you know to you and, and I think that's quite an, an interesting view and I, I've got a lot of stick for that the first time I put it on Instagram but but the truth is, I think that that's a valid point in a sense. You know, we always compare ourselves to people, I think, mostly who we could be similar to. Um, yeah, no, very interesting. So it's been a big success so far, right? I mean, you're looking great. You're in great shape. You're not far out, are you? Yeah, it's about five. I don't, I don't like saying it because it's scary. It's about five weeks out from the first show now. Yeah. Nice. I was going to say six weeks, but oh, nice. So generally then we're, we're getting close to the wire um anything that you think um you know if people listen to this thinking oh i'm really inspired by this i want to go and compete and we had a little chat about this just off air didn't we and, and it's something that a lot of people come through for our coaches saying i want to compete and i'm like have you really thought about this and i know you've kind of said look go for it you know a big advocate of just kind of throwing yourself in at the deep end but looking at the, the whole picture here is there anything that maybe if we were to step back and look from the outside in and maybe to give a word of not warning, but like reality to people, anything you would advise or anything you would say about that? Yeah, absolutely. So there is no denying that bodybuilding is an extreme sport. It is not, you know, you just have to go to the gym however many times per week. Um, if you're going to take it seriously, that is, and you want to get the very most out of it, you need to understand that this, is every aspect of your life. So it is nutrition down to, you know, counting every single macro, every single calorie. You are counting that, you are tracking that. You are spacing your meals at a certain time each day. You are eating however many meals. You're checking in with your coach, you're doing your steps, you're doing your cardio. And that is only going to get, you know, more, it's going to get more intense as you do get into a contest prep. And also it's not something which is, you know, only when you're prepping for a show in your off season or improvement season, when you are looking to still, you know, progress with muscle hypertrophy as much as possible, you still need to make sure that you are getting the best amount of sleep that you can for recovery. You need to be resting. You need to be taking your rest days. You really do need to realize that this is a whole lifestyle to or it's what you dedicate your life to um if you want to be the best if you just want to you know look good in a bikini you can do a photo shoot or something along those lines but in terms of we, we haven't even discussed posing you know there are different federations there are different posing styles and if you spend all of this time working on your physique to get you to where you need to be so you can step on stage but you can't present yourself, you're literally going to be at the bottom of the pile of who the judges look at. So again, it's almost like learn a dance routine, <laughs> spend money, spend lots of money on all of I was about stuff. to say, you've actually done a YouTube video on that, haven't you, about how much it costs. Yeah. I'll stick that in the, I'll stick that down below. So if you want to have a look at that, check out the comments and I'll, I'll link, I'll link you to it. Um, because it's a, a bit of an eye opener, isn't it? Oh yes, it really, really is. Um, it's 
rather expensive um, for, I would say definitely for females, it's going to be more expensive perhaps than it might be for males just due to the glam and the jewelry and the bikinis and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but even so, you know, it doesn't take away from the posing lessons, the price of a coach, you know, it, is it is extortionate um and also just to pay you know to be able to compete to pay your entry fees really really is expensive and above all above all you've got to ask yourself why do you want to compete why do you want to step on that stage and you know put the put the work in for a really long time in order to you know just have a body composition related goal to stand on stage I can I can explain why I want to do it, but a lot of people do go into competing for the wrong reasons. You know, it, it, if you're trying to get a revenge bod, there is a better way than having to put yourself in a position where actually you're really unhealthy because competing is not healthy. It is not healthy to get to such a low body fat percentage. It is particularly for females, you know, it has a huge yeah. impact on your hormones and really, really can impact your relationship with food. Um, Myself particularly, one of the things that held me back from competing initially or when I first started thinking about it, which I was really concerned about, I almost did like a little test prep as a, as a cut last year was because I do have a history with binge eating, which I had to seek help for. That is not something which you want to play around with. No, because your mental no. health matters so much more than ever stepping on a stage. Yeah, I agree with that fully. And I'm so glad you brought that up because I knew that anyway. Um, but it's it's a, it's a difficult thing to just be like, hey, can you discuss this? Um, but I'm so glad you did because people do not take this seriously enough. Um, I think what you said is absolutely spot on. You know, I probably wouldn't step on a stage personally because it's not something for me maybe I would in a couple of years I, it's not something I've ruled out it's just not something I've really committed to because I know that for me what that would take to get there it would likely impact a lot of other areas of my life which at the moment aren't necessarily in my list of things I want to change so a photo shoot cool I want to get some pictures looking good. Sweet. I'll have a photo shoot. I'm not going to get like that next, you know, for example, I could get down to like 10, 12%. I look pretty lethal at that probably, you know, with a tan, get a wax, you know, lush. Um, but the the next like budgie four. Smugglers. <laughs> <laughs> I love budgie smugglers, um, you know, but that next like 5%, that's where things start to go into the realms of unsustainable right like you said it, it's not necessarily super unhealthy to be there in the short term but absolutely as you rightly said you're not staying there you know you're not planning to stay there and actually i think when you go through your diets and, and when you've been dieting for a long time you know i'm sure you'll agree with me uh, there are times even on short diets where your brain's like ah oh, this is tough now like maybe we should eat some more of this stuff and that in itself you're you're playing with fire a little bit there and I think for a lot of people they see like you said um the kind of glam side of this but there is more to it there's absolutely more to it and hey you know th there's a huge amount of like self-efficacy to it as well in the fact that you're like you're going to achieve something that you've set yourself up for and you know you're feeling confident and feeling good and, and, and all of that great stuff so you know there's two sides to the coin I just think that there are big considerations to, to take into account. And as you rightly said, the why is important too. Um, I've never known anyone step on stage for a like a revenge bod, but I can absolutely see that being a thing. Like I can a hundred percent see that. Um, again, like do things for yourself, like for your personal reasons. Like I'm not going to ask you what yours are because they're for you, but I can almost guarantee that if we were to drag them out of you, they wouldn't be for anybody else. Um, because when push comes to shove, that's not really the shit that keeps you going, is it? It's um, it's the same like with work, you know, working very hard. No one makes you work, you know, 14, 15 hour days. If you're willing to do that shit and you're willing to put the time in, that's not because you're doing it for someone else unless you've got a family to support, which is obviously different. But, um, you know, that is something which I think is is a, is a personal thing. Um, so in terms of like struggles then, because we've kind of talked about like there are some negatives to this, like have you experienced anything so far that you're like, okay, like this is interesting. I kind of knew this was coming, but it's here now or I've experienced this that you can touch on. Yeah, absolutely. It makes me laugh that you say that because that's exactly what I thought last week when I was just like, it was like halfway through the day 
I had done my morning cardio, I'd done a lot of my steps and I just finished a meeting and it was like 1 p.m. Keep in mind, I get up about like quarter to five, five in the morning at the moment. And I was just like, I need to take a nap. <laughs> I saw this on your Instagram. <laughs> I was so exhausted. And I was just like, I've got client plans to do. I've got to respond to my clients. I've got a meeting in the afternoon. I've got to go train in the evening. I had a catch up call with my business mentor in the evening. And they are all non-negotiables in my life. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so not to mention that obviously you have prep, which is a whole non-negotiable in itself. But I have, you know, got other plates to spin in my life. And it's, it's, I think last week, so when I was six weeks out, that now it's cardio every single day. My step count is quite high. I'm still, you know, having to factor in all of my training. Coaching, it has ramped up to the point where for now, I've just kind of capped my numbers just so that I can maintain my kind of level of service. Yeah. And then I've still got my full-time job. And I was just like, I'm not even hungry for food I said this to to my current coach Danny I said I'm not hungry for food I'm literally hungry for energy because I even looking at the dishes knowing that I need to go and do those is exhausting like knowing that I need to hoover later and push the hoover around is terrifying because I know that's extra energy that I need to expend so like I'm at that point now where my knee is like oh. rock bottom and I just really can't be asked to do anything that requires extra energy. Yeah. So it's hilarious. Like carbs feel like a drug now. Like when I have a couple of rice cakes, when they kick in and I'm like, oh my goodness, like I've got the beans to do something for 20 minutes. It is at that point now where, you know, the, <laughs> the tank is empty. I am running on fumes, but the most important thing that I want to kind of acknowledge here is you best be ready to deal with the fact that your cognitive function is going to suffer. And yeah. I knew it was coming, but within this last week, I've definitely realized it and you can't predict it. At least I can't predict my kind of like good times or my bad times because it's very hit and miss at the moment. Some days I'll be fine. Some days I'll wake up fine. Some days I'll wake up and feel like I've been hit by a truck. So it's really, really, um, I, I feel like now like flexibility and like adaptability is the best power that I have is just to keep plodding along however I feel you do have to turn into that robot and you do have to only apply discipline because trust me I'm not motivated to do the dishes later but living by myself no one else is going to do them no that is it I do you know what? I, I I can empathize so much with this not from the fact that I'm about to compete or anything like that but I'm getting very close to the end of my diet and it's been like a quite a long 18 weeks and like the other day I put this on my story I was like um somebody in the gym you know when you have your headphones on and they're not got any music so you can hear what people are saying some guy was like oh look that guy's got his uh, watch strapped around his foot and I was like, I can literally hear you. Not only are you looking at me, so I could read your lips, but I actually have no music on in my ears right now. <laughs> but basically, I took a picture of it and put it on my story. And I was like, this is the level of steps I refuse to miss today because I had my um, I had my wrist straps on for, for benching. So I had the, the, the watch strapped around my foot and I was like, I'm missing shit today. You know, goodness oh, me, yeah. like it's in the mornings where like I've had to charge my watch. And I think I've been for like three P's last night. That's at least like 100 steps I could be counting <laughs> no honestly every everything counts and actually it's got to the stage now where when I go over my step count I get a little bit like frustrated because I'm like <laughs> I don't I need as few steps as possible because I don't want my recovery to be impacted like you ever get that with protein no no like yesterday vegan, of course as a vegan I have to really yeah fair, to fair. yesterday I ate 10 more grams of protein I was like shit that was at least like 20 more grams of potato <laughs> brilliant yeah no so you do you do start to be like so pedantic not to mention like yesterday I I had like a stupid amount of steps to get like something like 283 left so just pacing around my apartment like a mad woman at stupid o'clock because <laughs> all of that adds up it all does of, yeah all of those small efforts add up in the end and for me it's like not a single box cannot be ticked this whole prep so far it's been 12 weeks for me at the moment I have not missed one training session. I've not missed one step. I've not missed cardio. I've not missed a meal. I've not missed a gram of what I'm meant to be consuming. 
everything has been done and that's what I mean in terms of it's not just a oh I want to you know look good and step on a stage you do have to dedicate your life to it yeah absolutely it's a lifestyle right and I think actually it's a really interesting thing you bring up there because I think when you go through any process and believe it or not I truly believe that this appeals to or appeals but this occurs with people who also just trying to lose a bit of fat or gain a bit of muscle you don't have to have that same amount of accuracy but what I do think is that if you're going to go through the pain of a diet right you're going to be hungry you're going to be tired you're going to be a bit emotional maybe grumpy um hungry at times hangry even you know if you're going to do that fucking make it worthwhile you know be a bit more accurate don't like go into the cupboard and smash some more chocolate because what you've done is just suffered you know for the best part of a day say say for example you get into the end of the day you're a bit late making your dinner and you say ah oh, screw this i'm gonna have some chocolate you've just suffered all day to enjoy in the next 10 15 minutes and like that's just not worth it is it and i guess for you like you have this big end point um which i guess to some people be like well obviously you're going to be more dedicated but absolutely not because your level of restriction is so much higher so if you like that they're, they're kind of on par in that respect but equally you know you want to be standing there before you go on stage and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but without any regrets, any like, I could not have done anything more. And like, I say this to a lot of my clients, you know, when they're talking about scale weights and so on, like if you step on those scales in the morning and let the scales tell you how you performed, it's going to be a pretty sad day. But if before you do that, before you go through that process, you evaluate yourself and say, is there anything more I could have done? What more could I have done in the last 24 hours? You think, well, I hit my macros, hit my steps, I trained, got a good night's sleep. Right. If the scale weight happens to have not gone down, who gives a shit? Because there's nothing more you could have done. But, you know, like you, when you step on stage, getting on there, did I do everything I could? Did I take all those boxes every day? Damn right I did. So if the judges don't like the way I've presented myself today, or maybe that someone else has just done better. There's nothing I can do about that. I can't fight them on stage. You know, this isn't a contact sport. <laughs> but the thing is, I think the beauty of it is the, the beauty of my whole fitness journey in it since I started is they've all had different chapters and it always feels like I'm evolving into something else. Yeah. So if I step on stage and the judge says, you need to condition your glutes better for the next show. I'm going to go away and I'm going to go do my cardio even more and have something else to work on. Yeah, and then yeah. say after this competitive season, it's going to be like, right, well, what the hell do I want to do next? What's the new chapter? Yeah. And that's what I try and instill into my clients. It's never like 12 week plan, you know, we're going to get you shredded and then see yeah. you later. It's never sure. that. because it's, it's okay. So we'll do this dieting phase now, but then what's that that's going, to, going to lead us into? And then where do you want to be within a year's time? And yeah. it's constantly kind of seeing it as, as a, as long-term progress. Yes, um, absolutely. So I think that is, you know, if, if you're in this for the five minutes, it's, you're going to be the one who's more likely to do a whole day of dieting, come home, eat chocolate for a minute of mouth pleasure. And then, you know, that's your whole day just wiped out. So Sounds like one of those dodgy memes you post, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I say to my clients, you know, I've had so many, a, a lot of my girls, bless them, you know, when it's time of the month and they say they've got cravings, yeah. they really feel like eating this. I'm like, is that cookie really going to solve your problems and make you feel better? Is it really yeah. going to do that? In um, most cases, it's probably going to make them a lot worse. Exactly, exactly. What, would you feel better if you'd remained disciplined and maybe just went out and got a walk and got your steps in instead? And yeah. then, you know, you, you learn to practice that discipline. And that's our kind of like team motto I've ended up finding is all the messages of success and celebration I get is, today I chose discipline over motivation because yeah. you know, it's fleeting. It's not always there. It's definitely not something which hangs around much. Um, not now for me at the moment anyway, no, but no. I've got no choice. You know, I'll be going to train legs after this and safe to say my legs feel like they're 50 kilos heavier each today, but I'm going to go do it anyway, because that yeah. is the beauty of the process um, is, is challenging yourself both mentally and physically. It's interesting, actually, isn't it? I would say that to an extent, it, it's almost like not a choice. It's not like a decision you make. It's like a, you know, we talk about like the, the, like the absolute non, non-negotiables, the things that just are getting done regardless. Like I see training as one of those things. Like I don't see it as something that's in my day of like, 
oh, I probably will go and train. You know, it would be more of an inconvenience to me if somebody said, hey, like, can you do this for me at 7 a.m. tomorrow? I'd be like, uh, uh, because, <laughs> yeah. you know, I'd be so conflicted by the fact that I should be doing something else. Like, that's just my routine. Um, plus, I like my early morning bowl of Coke Pops. But the 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 thing there, I think, is is, as you say, it's like, what are we doing here are we here because of an emotion which and i think i think motivation's a bastard to be honest i think it's it's like that friend in school who convinces you to join like the the school x factor or the school play and then when you get up there and actually do it they just start laughing and throwing things at you because it is you know motivation will be the thing that gets you out of bed the first week and then it will make you feel so shit about yourself the following week when it leaves you because it's not there anymore and you start to feel worthless because you're not getting out of bed and it's like it was never that in the first place you know and, and I analyze this as like a fire you know a motivation will start the fire but if you don't take care of it and you don't commit to adding more bits to it to make sure that it keeps going then no shit Sherlock it's going to go out um, and like you probably say to your clients it's what we do each day that, com- that, that, that is that commitment to it it is that you know consistent reinforcement of habits and reinforcement of daily targets or you know the small things that add up to be the big wins in the end you know when when you look back over this journey there won't be i don't think any one big thing that you'll be like that's the shit that did it it will be all the things that nobody thinks about going to bed waking up you know caffeine intake taking a nap because you really need one uh, you know that's the stuff that really adds up isn't it Absolutely, absolutely that. I totally agree in terms of you can't ever rely on motivation to get you to where you need to be. Um, But what you do need to have, um, similar to what I was saying, you know, you you need to have the the why do you want to compete, regardless of whether that's competing or not, you just need to have your why in general. Like I have my why for why I started my online coaching, for the YouTube, for the Instagram, for the fact that I get up at stupid o'clock every single day to allow me not only to do prep related stuff, but to do my coaching work and all the other work that I do outside of my actual work. Yeah. And you have to have that strong why. And it's something which I ask every single client, which I take on. It's why, why now? Why, yeah. why me? Why have you come to me? And it's all of those kind of things, which I want to know, because if you're um and are about it, you're not sure and it's probably not the right time and you need to solidify that for yourself in, yeah. in terms of whatever your goals are or what you're wanting to achieve. Um, because otherwise, as you say, as soon as motivation goes away, you're just going to be there sat on your ass, not bothered to do anything. So I, I absolutely agree with that. Yeah, that's, um, that, that is it. So generally speaking, then we are six, five weeks out. We do the five weeks. Are you, how many shows have you got planned? So I've got, the first show is a qualifier. It's a regional qualifier with two rows. And then the second show, which is four weeks later, is another one of the same. Just to give me um, more stage time, more stage experience. Yeah. You know, first time I'm going to get on the stage, who knows how I'm going to be feeling. Um, I will be having a shot of tequila and some salt for the pump behind the scenes. Um, but I'm not sure how, you know, how it's going to go. And it will allow me a little bit of time to improve. Yeah. Then four weeks after that second show would be, the the British finals if I if I did qualify um and, and that would probably be the the last show that I would do there are plenty of different federations um you know that I could compete with but I think in your first season don't like you can do more than one but I just don't want to overload myself just yet it's you know just the whole process of prep has been enough let alone yeah. learn different posing styles and all that kind of stuff so for now I'm really taking it one step at a time and just aiming on the the first show really yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a really good shout. I think take one step at a time, right? You you can't kind of uh, jump the second hurdle before you've cleaned the first mm-hmm. one. So after that, then obviously there'll be some feedback, there'll be some work to do. Um, are we going straight into an off season? Are we? Because I guess if you get into the finals, that'll be around the end of this kind of break. So you'll be competing three times, or will it be four? So it will be twice that I've got my I've got two shows planned, and if I do get to finals, it will be a third show, and third that. Show. Will be- how yep. far after is that one? So what will be your like period of competing? So it's 6th of June, 4th of July, and then finals would be on the 1st of August. So it's four weeks apart pretty much. For cool. So you've got like an eight week kind of um, window then, if you like. Yeah, exactly. And that's going to be tough, to be honest, between yeah. shows to, to hold condition. It, it will be tough. It's not going to be something that's easy. Um, but 
again, that's something which I had in mind. And to be honest, I think post-show is probably going to be the hardest part when, you know, yeah. reverse dieting, um, that, that's going to be something which is you're going to have to practice a huge amount of restraint and really start to rebuild that relationship with, with food. So I think for me, yeah. that's going to be the most challenging part by far. Yeah, I actually, I, I must admit, I think that's always the bit that I look at the most and think this will be the biggest challenge, like even in diets that I've done myself um, and with clients. And the reason for that is that people always want or look, and I'm not saying that you do this, but people always look at that end bit being the competition or the fat loss they've achieved but that's actually not the end that's like halfway because then you've got a, for you it'll obviously be into the improvement season um but for like our clients it's like right how do we get you out of here into a you know reverse diet of some description to get you this consistently and i think that it's such a, a misconception of like my goal is achieved end of story it's like no 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 like the hard bit starts now because you were motivated to get to this point you're probably not motivated now to carry on tracking in order for us to reverse you healthily and, and get you into a good and, and nice spot with your food relationships and maybe even get to a place where we don't need to track anymore. But that's the bit where I think most, it's probably the most fragile point. Um, so I can understand why you're kind of apprehensive about that. Do you have any kind of plans for that yet? Or is that, I guess that's quite a way away for you, maybe not even kind of thought about that yet. In terms of plans for it, the the one I got asked this question on an Instagram story, and I just replied to it with the only thing that I can do is do everything which I have have done thus far, and it's execute my plan to a T to trust yeah. my coach and do everything that my coach tells me, and to be completely open and honest with her. You know, there is not a single thing that my coach does not know, um, because lying to your coach is literally shooting yourself in the foot they are there to take care of you they're there to look after you to remove that stress that self-doubt that worry so that's what I'm going to do I will be yeah. open and honest um and I'll just try my very fucking best <laughs> like I don't Absolutely. really know if I will you know who, who's to say that I won't have slightly disordered eating afterwards it's very very possible um it's very likely in terms of what I've heard from most bodybuilders post-show but I plan to use those calories and those carbs for a really good rebound phase to, to really work on on training as hard as I can because at the end of the day that's a really you know capitalizing on coming out of, of the end of a diet and and soaking up that food is really important actually yeah. um, so I'm not planning on like jetting off to Dubai straight away I like to I will maintain an element of consistency really so yeah. good, you know three to four weeks afterwards I'm just going to get straight back into my routine keep it as normal and just have a bit more food yeah. Because if you do something completely out of the ordinary where you have no consistency and routine, then you're so much more likely to fall victim to falling totally off track and just having everything go tits up, to be honest. Yeah, I think that's actually not just for competitors, but for people who have like refeed weekends or refeed weeks, you know, it's like, OK, sweet, see you later, protein, chocolate's in now. And it just drives your kind of palatability rewards kind of um, system just completely through the window. Um, and of course, if you're already incredibly hungry, which I'm sure you will be, um, that's really not a helpful thing to have, like that hyper palatability, like superfood focus, which comes from having those more enjoyable foods. So, yeah, I can absolutely see that being the most challenging. And, and I absolutely wish you the best of luck with it. You know, I'm really, really excited to see you step on stage. I think it'll be a really cool thing for a lot of us to kind of watch you through this whole process process from start to finish and obviously you've been really open and um have shared a lot of your journey not just on youtube but on instagram as well so i think the cool thing for us is getting to see the cherry on the cake and, and actually seeing you you put that onto stage and however that goes you know i think everyone will agree with me who's watched this that there really isn't anything that we could see that you could have done any more with and i think you know in that regard i mean it's irrelevant what everyone else says but i think you've got to be pretty happy with yourself and um, as you say, you know, put the pieces to the puzzle now and, and watch it work, basically, because there's nothing more that you can do other than what you're doing. And uh, I guess it's just a, a bit of a waiting game now and, and into the competition we go. Yeah, absolutely. But it's fully on the gas now that there, there is no stopping. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited. Um, and the fact that I have documented the whole process, which was largely for myself in terms of on YouTube. Um, yeah. 
war it is now even just looking literally like five six weeks back and looking at my posing or looking how I felt mentally and now having come on leaps and bounds it's been amazing to document that for me but also the fact that there are plenty of other first timers competing in different you know different classes federations all things like that who are saying to me like this is really useful I never considered this particularly the cost about competing I had a lot of feedback on that so so that's why I try and share everything as much as I can is because I'm a human I don't tend to have much of a filter in terms of my personality I am very straightforward and I will you know be as transparent as I can with everyone even yeah. when things aren't going so well you know a few weeks ago I felt really nervous about not being ready on time um you know you do kind of get this weird body dysmorphia looking at yourself every single day it is overwhelming and I will talk about it and I want other people to know so yeah. that's kind of what I just feel like um, my purpose is right now is to to just show as much as I can but also not to the extent where it's getting a bit too much for me should that ever be the case you know it's totally cool to step away from social media yeah. and to yeah. give yourself a bit of a break I've seen loads of competitors do it loads of people who just you know get overwhelmed with social media in general and it is really important to put your mental health first I couldn't agree with that anymore. Millie, I'm going to say thank you ever so much for your time there. I think this is actually a really nice place to, to wrap this one up. And I think that everyone will have really enjoyed the show. I think everyone will have really taken a lot away from this. Um, I want to thank you ever so much for your time. And I know you've got a leg session to go and do. So uh, with that in mind, I'm not going to keep you any longer. Um, get your rice cakes in and, and go and have fun. But before I do let you go, can you just let the people know where they can find you? Um, if you've got any thing else coming up or anything else you're excited about then do let us know um but yeah let, let people know where they can find you and um hopefully i can put the stuff in the bottom as well but it'd be nice to hear from you as well brilliant no thank you so much it's been so great to catch up and just to, to have a little bit of a a little bit of a chin wag um so in terms of we everyone can find me um on instagram i'm at coached by millie um and then on youtube i am millie Svetkovic. good luck spelling my surname you can just follow the link in my Instagram bio, um, which will take you to my YouTube if you can't type that surname. Um, but I do have a really exciting month coming up in terms of what I'm planning to film for YouTube. Of course, I've got five weeks now until my show. So um, there's a lot that I'll be showing off and it's getting to the nitty gritty now. So for people who want to follow along that, please do. Um, and, you know, for any kind of coaching related informative stuff, um, please do just kind of follow along the Instagram because I post a lot on there. Fantastic. I'll put all of that stuff in the notes anyway. So if you, <laughs> if you do not know how to spell that surname, then <laughs> you can just bang the link in the, in the comments and, uh, and it'll take you straight there. Millie, thank you ever so much for your time. We really do appreciate you. I hope you have a fantastic leg session. Guys, I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you ever so much for joining us on the JLX Friends of Benefits podcast. Have a good one. Take care now. Bye-bye. <laughs>